Hello and welcome back to what is now stage two chemistry. Uh, of course, we are starting with topic one, which is monitoring the environment. It's broken up into five subtopics. The first subtopic is all about global warming and climate change. We're going to cover this first science understanding. Some gases in the atmosphere called greenhouse gases keep the Earth's atmosphere warmer than it would be without these gases. This is known as the greenhouse effect. We will need to describe the action of common greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, to maintain a steady temperature in the Earth's atmosphere. So firstly, what is a greenhouse? And many of you are probably aware of what a greenhouse is. If you're not, then just bear with me and I'll explain to you what it is essentially. So imagine that this is a so-called greenhouse here. It's made up of glass, uh, of a glass exterior. And so what happens is you can get sunlight, which is represented as short wave or short wavelength radiation, which can pass through the transparent glass. Uh, once it passes through, some of that radiation gets absorbed by objects in the greenhouse, like this plant here. And when they absorb this radiation, some of it can be released as a different form what we refer to as long wave radiation or long wavelength infrared radiation. And these objects which can emit this long wavelength infrared radiation, if they emit it, the glass itself actually acts as a barrier. So it keeps all this infrared or heat radiation within the greenhouse. So if you ever have been to a greenhouse, you would notice that it actually is a fair bit warmer than its surroundings and this is the essential way in which it actually works. In terms of the earth itself we know that the earth is surrounded by an atmosphere and in that atmosphere we have a similar effect which we term the greenhouse effect. So how does this work? Well it's actually very very similar. So we've got radiation from the sun it's giving out various forms of radiation. So we've got its own infrared radiation, visible light, as well as ultraviolet, and other ones as well. Uh, about half of the radiation actually gets reflected by the Earth, though. So we can think of gases in the atmosphere, we can think clouds, we can think surfaces can be reflectors of this radiation. I said that half of the radiation gets uh, reflected in some way, so the remaining half um, can be absorbed by the Earth's surface and therefore warm it. Some of this absorbed radiation then gets ad uh, emitted as long wavelength infrared radiation. And you can see we've got this short wavelength uh, light radiation here. We can see over to the right side that it's been converted into this longer wavelength infrared radiation. Some of this radiation is going to escape out into space. Some of it, however, will be absorbed by the so-called greenhouse gases, um, where it will uh, absorb it and then it will re-emit that radiation in all directions. And the important thing is that some of it will be uh, re-emitted back down to the Earth. And so it essentially acts as a bit of a barrier to trap this infrared radiation and to maintain the Earth's uh, temperature at a relatively steady um, rate or steady temperature of about 15 degrees Celsius. I've already mentioned that uh, the temperature is maintained at roughly this 15 degrees Celsius. It's going to be approximately 32 degrees Celsius warmer than without this greenhouse effect. These greenhouse gases absorb heat in the infrared region and re-emit it as I've mentioned before and it will trap some of this within the Earth's atmosphere. Some of these greenhouse gases consist of things like water vapour which we naturally find in our atmosphere. Carbon dioxide and methane are our two big ones that I guess we're focusing on. You do have other ones such as nitrous oxide. Ozone can also act as a greenhouse gas You've also got chlorofluorocarbons, which have known to be um, an issue in the past. So to the next understanding, anthropogenic increases in greenhouse gases 
disrupt the thermal balance of the atmosphere. You need to explain the warming associated with global climate change and its consequences for the environment. So anthropogenic or human influences, we know increase the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The one big one that you would be familiar with is CO2 or carbon dioxide. The enhanced greenhouse effect results in more thermal energy being retained. This then leads to a phenomenon which we call global warming, which is an overall increase in global temperatures. What can actually cause this enhanced greenhouse effect? We know that cars are a source of CO2. The internal combustion engines of motor vehicles um, will uh, burn fossil fuels and convert it into carbon dioxide. We know factories and power stations are going to be major sources as well because they also burn fossil fuels as a means of energy production or electricity production. Increased deforestation and land clearing also reduce the ability to reduce carbon dioxide levels because we know that plants, such as trees, um, will use processes like photosynthesis as a means of uh, taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and converting them into carbon-based compounds like glucose. Increased farming um, of ruminant animals, which consists of cattle and sheep. Uh, ruminant animals are those which often uh, chew their food for long periods of time, and they are known to uh, produce a large amount of methane emissions. Other farming practices, uh, in particular rice uh, farms, rice paddies, can also increase methane concentrations because they provide an anaerobic environment um, for things like bacteria to convert carbon-based compounds into methane. What does this actually all mean? So uh, we've essentially collected data um, in regards to CO2 emissions for the past 50 years or so. And one particular location is found in uh, Mauna Loa, which is in Hawaii, and it's been collecting data essentially every day since the late 1950s. What we can see from this graph is overall from this late 1950s all the way to current times is that CO2 emissions have been increasing. And it's actually reached a record high it's never been in recorded history. Um, it's never reached over 400 parts per million. We can look back even further, and this looks at um, data obtained from ice core samples in places like Antarctica. What we can find is that these carbon dioxide concentrations do naturally fluctuate over time. So you can see that in this graph here, where it uh, decreases and then increases. And you're looking at uh, data from hundreds of thousands of years. And what we can see up until current time, or well, sort of current, so over 10 years back, you can see that there's been this massive increase from any other peaks from these previous occasions. So that does jump out as a bit of a concern. We know that climate is something that's measured over extremely large periods of times. So we're talking decades and decades of time. And we look for general patterns in weather, so things like temperature and rainfall. Scientific evidence shows that climate change is actually um, accelerating. So we can see it changing faster and faster compared to previous occasions. Looking at some scientific data, we can see um, that temperatures in particular have been higher than the so-called mean between the previous century. So from 1901 to 2000, um, we can see, especially in the later periods, looking this region here, that there have been generally much greater temperatures than this so-called average, which we set as this zero. What this means is that with increased global temperatures, it's going to mean that we're going to get greater evaporation of water. And I told you before that water is a greenhouse gas. 
So if this is in our atmosphere, it's going to increase the amount of heat being retained within the atmosphere. This therefore will lead to increased temperatures and we are seeing evidence of that today. To throw some more evidence to you, we can see some satellite imagery, so to speak, um, back in September of 1979. And we're looking further north in the Arctic region. And what we know is that this um, sea ice, sea and land ice, is actually on the rapid decline. We're actually seeing reduced levels of this polar ice up in the Arctic. Arctic sea ice has actually been declining at a rate of approximately 13% per decade. So if you go from 1979, September, up to 2015, September, you can see that there's been quite a drastic difference. And year, uh, within each year, there will be slight fluctuations, but you can see that there's been quite a significant decline in the amount of polar ice. Another issue is looking at glaciers. Glaciers represent essentially very, very slow moving bodies of ice and they are a source of fresh water. This picture shows you a, a kind of before and after and it's showing you uh, what we call retreating glaciers. By comparing the two photos, we can see that these glaciers have um, vanished in certain areas or at least they are uh, declining in, in other areas. Retreating glaciers alter temperature and they also affect salinity, so looking at salt concentrations in water um, in various regions in the ocean. This then can affect the circulation of global ocean currents, and we know that ocean currents can impact upon um, quite massively on weather and climate. Another concern is looking at permafrost. So permafrost is essentially frozen soil and rock, and this can often contain trapped methane. We know that a lot of this permafrost is thawing and melting, and it's led to the release of methane from um, sources called methane hydrates from this ice. So essentially this has been trapped in the ice for quite some time, and with it melting, uh, it's releasing quite staggering amounts of uh, methane into the atmosphere. Looking at some satellite data, uh, we can look at changes to sea levels. And even if we just look within the past 20 years or so, we can see that the sea levels have actually uh, risen um, quite significantly. And in actual fact, on average, sea levels uh, have risen by about 1.4 millimeters per year from 1900 to the year 2000. That is up to 3.41 millimetres per year. This is the fastest sea level rise that Earth has experienced within 3,000 years. Ocean temperature increases um, will result in water expansion and this then causes the subsequent sea level rise. We know that with sea level rising, uh, this can affect all habitats that live on or near the coastlines, and that includes us humans. As one final piece of evidence, I think you've been aware, I know I've been aware of this, but the Earth has been suffering from more weather extremes. In America in recent times, they've been suffering from massive uh, uh, cold periods, uh, cold snaps, as you would call it. Uh, in Australia, we know that we've suffered from droughts and from uh, some quite hot periods. Global warming can essentially increase the frequency and severity of these extreme weather events. Uh, so we can talk about blizzards, floods, bushfires, tornadoes, you name the lot. They generally have been seen to be occurring much, much more frequently in recent time. Having said that, that's the end of the first video, so I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.